Thank you. Um, I'll never actually forget the first time I played that song in front of an audience. Um, after 20 years of experience and coming up on stage, usually the adrenaline's kind of hard to get going, but not on that night because my hands are sweating, my knees were shaking, I was absolutely terrified. Because this is the first time I'd ever put anything even remotely close to the intimate feelings of my heart for somebody that I loved. And that was for another woman, and I thought everyone was gonna see through me it was definitely a gay song, and that I didn't know what I thought was going to happen, but with a largely conservative Christian audience that I had as well, I thought pretty much I had a 50% oppor opportunity of somebody throwing a shoe at me, having people walk out. Um, it was pretty terrifying an experience. Um, but kind of one of the things that I think about is that 
You know, all of us are pretty much straight until we come out. It's, it's kind of a weird thought, but up until that moment, until I shared this intimate detail with somebody else in my life, I was just Jen, I was this heterosexual singer who sang love songs about everybody, and it was universal heterosexually, and now all of a sudden I was singing gay songs. It couldn't possibly be about love. Um, and that was kind of this weird spot that I found myself in, and that all of a sudden, in the course of about that three and a half minutes of playing that song, I went from being a normal, everyday kind of human being to being part of a demographic. <laughs> I went to being a percentage for the first time in my life in a way that I'd never really quite understood. And in particular, because of my interaction with faith community, I definitely felt the pinch of that. Um, and so when I talk about LGBT issues, sometimes I find myself with, with all the things that are going on. I mean, DOMA's, DOMA's passed. You know, we've gotten rid of DOMA. Don't Ask, Don't Tell has kind of gone the way. And there's gay marriage in an, an amazing amount of states. And even I sometimes find myself as a gay person wondering, you know, what more is there to say about LGBT issues? Like, is it really an issue? Like, I'm kind of bored already. You know, what more can I do on an everyday basis? And moreover, if you're not LGB or T, you kind of might wonder why it is that you'd be asked to put a dog into a fight. So I kind of go nerdy a little bit, and I start looking at the statistics. Thank you, Pew Research, and my upcoming speech. Um, in 2013, uh, one of the, the things that basically kind of really surprised me is that 90% of us Americans, around 90% of us actually know somebody in our sphere of influence. Or, you know, friend, neighbor, somebody, a whispered, rumored coworker, something like that. We're aware of somebody who's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered in our community. That number is somewhere around 50% when you talk about an intimate friend, somebody in your family, really close coworker, or something like that. Um, so there's, there's points of disparity between, you know, what we know, what we see on TV, and then actually getting to meet someone, you know, my gay friend, um, to really kind of nail that home. But, you know, while a lot of us are kind of familiar with that issue, the part that actually really strikes me as really difficult to kind of understand is that when you talk about the social quality of all the great things that we've accomplished in LGBT equality, gay marriage and, you know, better work, uh, workplace environments and better laws that are still kind of we're still needing to put that through. In order to be able to access any of that, one still has to come out into the social world. And in that social world, LGBT acceptance is still only about 60%. So to put that another way, 60% approval. So to put that another way, if you were to come out that one three and a half minutes for you, to tell where your story lies in the LGBT story, whether you're approving or not approving, whether you come out to someone else, you basically stand a, 50 a little bit better than a 50% chance of that being a positive experience for you.
So while I spend a lot of my time talking about LGBT issues, if ever at all, besides being in a bar and flirting with chicks while I play gigs, um, I talk about this a lot in churches where the minute you mention sex, everyone's butt cheeks tighten, heads are elevated three inches, and we all wonder what in the world that we're talking about. But it's actually really simple. It's not about sex at all. It's about getting to know one another and loving each other where you're and when you find them. It's... There's no love song that I'll ever play that's inherently gay. There's, it's not. I mean, I'd like to write a gay love song. Apparently gay pride parades need more anthems. Um, but I'm just me, and I know what love is, and I think you know what love is too. And I think of the 90% of the people that you know in your life, you'd like to love them back. So I've really only got three things to say about it, and they're, they're not just LGBT things that we can make a difference in our lives, but in all of the social justice ways that we can each make an impact. One is that the world tends to tell us that our individual space actually doesn't matter. We kind of get in a habit of devaluing, one, our individual empowerment, like this little thing that I do next to the water cooler, saying, you know, holding the hand of a friend or standing up to a joke at the right time in the right moment. Those little things actually really significantly matter. So one is to remember that we all have the value, and I believe, the immense power to make an impact in somebody's daily life. And there are three, three ways that we can do that. And one is proximity, to be able to change the proximity that we have against with somebody else. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase that it's difficult for prejudice to survive proximity. In that if you get to know your neighbor, if you get to lessen the gap between you and you, the pre people that you're prejudiced against, the people that you're a little wary of, the people that you don't understand, if you learn to tell your story and in turn have a genuine curiosity about somebody else's story and adventure, it's really difficult for us to maintain our prejudices in that, in that environment. So close down the proximity gap. The second is silence. Martin Luther King said this, and I love it. He said that our lives begin to end the day that we are silent about the things that matter. Our silence implies our consent when we see someone hurting and say nothing about it. Our silence implies that we're straight and it's okay that you think we're straight. It plays itself out on both sides of that. So get to know someone and be curious about that. Break the silence that actually gets us handcuffed into increasing that distance between one another. And silence, if our words matter, if what we say matters, then let's know what we are saying. So the last and the most important to me is that we get educated. Ballot, you know, ballot initiatives are coming to you. If your state hasn't already voted on LGBT measures, if your church hasn't already preached about it, if you haven't already gone to the ballot box and wondered what it is you're checking yes or no for, it's coming to you. So be educated about what you're talking about. Don't just take someone else's word for it. And be curious. Above all, one of the things that I talk to people about the most is that be willing to have someone ask as many questions of you as you would like to ask of them. Ask me any question you want. I may think you're stupid for a little bit, but mostly I'm just really glad that you care. So thanks. Why does a shoot 
you can bleed till you dry. Tree. 